Hi, I'm Jed. Hey, Jonathan, how you doing? Good, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yes, how about myself? Uh, it's not the best. I think your okay. microphone's a bit... Yeah, that's much better. Okay, I'll have yeah. to do this then. Okay. <laughs> Um, let me just see. I didn't print out the uh, introduction, so let's see. No, no okay. Worries. Just pinging David. I think he's joining. Uh, I know it just, there we go. There we are. Hey, David. Hi, David. Hey, how's it going? This is a this is a first. Never get to see what's behind David. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've conveniently positioned it to so that like it's not facing any of the windows because otherwise I look like I'm, uh, you know, being interviewed uh, by the FBI <laughs> or something like a whistleblower. It's all dark. Uh, it's, it's good. So you get to see the one, you know lightless as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so on the right hand side, we'll see any questions and things that come through, right? That's right. May have to encourage the questions. Sure. Great. So it'll start in two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah, something like that. Two minutes. Minutes. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I turned off the eggs. <laughs> it's a bit dark here, isn't it? They put the lighting on the wall. Yeah, that's a little better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in a co-working space, so uh, let's see. Let's just put up the title, All right? How do you drive rapid innovation in a legacy heavy environment? Okay. Let me see. So we have uh, just a few people here already. I'll just give it a few more. I'll just give it another minute. Um, so welcome to those who have come. Um, by way of a brief introduction, because this is a really short session. I think it's just about 25 minutes. Yeah. Okay, we'll just give it another minute, see who else comes. So I think at any time, anybody can, can press the relevant button and, and speak up. Um, so it's going to be an interactive session. And the session today is with VMware. Of course, um, VMware is known for, for, for famously for, I would say, compute storage and network for virtualization. But it's much more these days, providing a platform uh, to enable technology-driven innovation with all that, what that means. Um, so lots of things happening at VMware. Uh, today it's going to be a um, well a lighthearted talk um, around lighthearted in that it's uh, about innovation and design thinking. So I would say creative. Um, 
So the idea here is really to, to see what you can do with your legacy systems and we'll explore this innovation um, involving modernizing your environment, um, sort of using the technical deck, and I think the term used here is paying it down, um, we'll find out what that means and how to get the right approach to turn your legacy um, systems from a potential technical liability into an asset. Right? Isn't, isn't that the job of IT to, to, to make the, the systems an asset and, and, and help, help grow the business? Um, so there's going to be quite a lot of different topics here. Um, but I think the first thing is, uh, rather than getting into the detail, I think the important thing is to introduce the speakers. Uh, in no particular order, we've got Amjad and David. So Amjad is a product leader and he helps uh, build products sort of both the business and consumer channels. Um, and this is in uh, industries like e-commerce, airlines and telco, insurance government, so just about everything, including NGOs, I see. Um, and I see Amjad is also an advocate of autonomous teams. They'll be interested to know what, that, what he means by that. Um, I see lean product management and so forth. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Amjad and add anything else. And uh, David's from Pivotal Labs, right? Recently acquired, maybe not so recently, by VMware. Um, David is a long time there at Pivotal Labs and a software engineer and engineering background. So, you know, tech guy. Um, writing, deploying in all sorts of languages, Ruby, Golang, Java, Kotlin, um, and doing so in the US and Australia. So with that, I think I'd, I'd leave it to you, you, you gentlemen to sort of position the session in terms of, you know, what you mean by migration and where APIs play a role and how that aligns, you know, IT as, a, um, as an asset to support the business goals. How does that sound? Yeah, it sounds great. So um, why, why don't we just kick off? I, I think the... The reason why we really like talking about this topic is because, um, you know, oftentimes you come to these conferences and you see people talking about building these amazing, cool things and these new techniques and you should do this and you should do that. But then you look at your environment and you say, well, how the heck am I going to do that when I have a bunch of 15 year old Java, a bunch of 30 year old, 40 year old, you know, uh, mainframe, uh, you know, I, I want to do those things, but how can I do that? How, how does that fit with my environment? I can't picture it. And even if I could picture it, how the heck am I going to justify doing this migration? How am I going to get the business on board with it or, and not just drag them along, you know, bring them in as a true partner? So that's really what we wanted to talk about because that's what Amjad and I spend a great deal of our time uh, helping our customers do. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, this hopefully hits home for a lot of people because legacy really is um, quite predominant in many organizations, uh, uh, wherever you are and whatever industry you're in. Um, if you look about it, if you think about it, you know, there's it's quite difficult to sometimes get rid of uh, legacy software. Um, and, you know, there's many examples where you come across legacy software in your day-to-day -day, um, you know, activities, whether it's um, your bank and you're trying to create an, a, an account in a bank and you're having to go physically into a branch um, so that somebody can see you and you can go through your KYC process. Or even if you're going into a hospital, you often see people walking around with these things called pages. You know, what's, the, what's, the, uh, what's the reason for you know, a lot of this legacy sticking around? You know, and there's a really interesting example. I actually lived in um, Zurich in Switzerland uh, for a number of years, and um, I, I did a little bit of work with um, with uh, the FIFA transfer system. So that's the transfer of um, soccer players from club to club. And uh, I know until today, they still send faxes out to be able to, to transfer one player to another club. Um, and there's, there's reason why legacy still exists in, in uh, many environments. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, one of the interesting things that comes up when it comes to legacy that we always get asked is, you know, should I be driving this with, you know, cool new little digital stuff on the outside? Or should I be you know, looking at my core systems uh, 
and and how do I how do I approach either of those two things? Do I just you know make it a pure technical migration and the business value comes later, or uh, or should I start with the business value in mind? Um, and you know I I think those are some really interesting topics for us to dig into. So um, I'm Chad. Maybe uh, you want to just share a bit of your thoughts, and we can uh, go from there. Sure. Um, I, I think um, you know we, we've we've talked about um, you know legacy a little bit here, right? Um, and, and I think the the title that we look at rapid innovation. I just want to briefly talk about what innovation um, can mean and why perhaps legacy might hold us back there. And, and then we'll dig into maybe some strategies. So if you look at um, innovation, uh, and this is not my definition, but there's uh, a lot of people out there that will look at innovation in this way. Um, I'm a big advocate of the theory of jobs to be done. And um, I think Anthony Ulwick talks about, you know, four types of strategies that innovation looks at. And, you know, one of them being a dominant strategy. So that's where you're trying to um, serve a need, like 20% better, uh, maybe cheaper in the market, you know, and you're trying to win, um, you know, customers that are underserved. So when you look at that, um, examples of that might be, you know, something like Netflix, you know, when they first started off, they were, you know, a little bit better than, you know, your blockbusters out there or, you know, um, you know, other other tools where you could potentially borrow movies. Right. Um, another strategy is a differentiated strategy. So you're looking at um, something like where you're trying to win underserved customers. Um, so if you look at maybe PlayStation, Sony PlayStation, when it first came out, right, um, that market has certainly moved along right now. And there's a whole bunch of streaming services for games and all that kind of stuff. But initially it was like maybe um, PlayStation might fall under that or a Dyson vacuum cleaner might be in a differentiated strategy. Now, when you look at those different types of strategy, um, how do you go about serving um, a customer in that market um, when you've got legacy code that's out there, right? Um, that in itself can be quite challenging. Uh, maybe David, you want to talk about some of the issues that you know legacy may may encounter? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's very common that when you're dealing with a lot of legacy code, that your operating costs are just out of control. Um, you know, you're just spending so much of your time, money, budget, uh, mind share of people thinking about maintenance, support. Uh, how can I even you know, just get some minor enhancements in, let alone some big initiative, but just, you know, those few really nagging minor enhancements that could be high leverage for the business. And meanwhile, you're dealing with all these outages and, and potentially having to um, you know, mitigate those. Sometimes your legacy is rock solid and people don't want to touch it for fear of having outages. Other times uh, on the flip side, the thing is, you know, Going down and taking frequent downtime, and um, so you're you're um, similarly constrained because you're having to pour water on the fire all the time. So high operating costs and just the stress uh, can be a big factor there. And this is really the, the other aspect of this is you know with all of that, with those high operating costs, the business is less likely to want to invest in those areas. Um, and you know, going at going off of what I'm trying to say, it's really hard to put in place some of those strategies, uh, cracking into new markets, better serving your customers when you're basically treading water. Um, so you end up just settling for or dealing with the fact that your systems are not very good and having to make up for it in other ways, like you know. Oh, what if we just, you know, cut our rates a little bit? Or what if we just, you know, come up with this new compelling product, uh, financial product, as opposed to thinking, man, it's painful to deal with us and we're losing customers to challenger banks because it's very easy to use their mobile apps. So there's sort of, um, you often see this gymnastics in the business of you know, trying to do these other things to make up for the fact that your technology is not appealing and not very... Uh, friendly to customers. So, you know, you're, you're treading water trying to not lose market share when, uh, when these competitors are coming up 
and you know eating your lunch because they're getting to start from a, a blank slate. Not to mention in, in financial services industry, especially uh, as well as government, the whole host of security and compliance issues that come about when you have legacy systems that are hard to patch. Can you get that new you know, operating system version in? Can you patch Heartbleed? You know, all of these different things. How quick are you to react to these major security vulnerabilities? So all of those things combined uh, make it well really tough to live with legacy, but equally tough to make a case to, to change. Thanks, thanks, David. Well, wow, there's quite a lot of things to consider. Um, <laughs> I'll tie it to some questions that have come in uh, before the event, if I may, related to this topic on innovation and these challenges. So one, one which might be relevant is um, how do you see the um, COVID impacting innovation? And um, to that point is where can we use APIs, agility, to move away from the stable balance that IT has been maintaining? So really two questions there. Has COVID changed anything? And in that respect, can we take advantage of how, how might we start with, with agility, with using a APIs as well, even though they're separate things? Sure. Uh, maybe uh, let's, let's talk about the COVID one for a sec. I think, um, if anything, in our roles, um, you know, David and I, we help many organizations to to address some of their uh, challenges right so we we run the consultancy arm of, of vmware and we have noticed that particularly within the COVID period if anything there is more of a need to start to address um long-standing issues um you know and to be able to address legacy new opportunities the environment's changed we need to do something about it um, so if anything, you still need to do this, and there's probably more compelling reason to do this right now. Um, and the second part of that, your question, the API one, I think um, that's actually quite a nice segue because one thing that we wanted to talk about was some things that we've seen while we're talking to many of our clients is that um, typically technology is seen as a silver bullet to solving a lot of the legacy problems. And we found that um, one of the worst things that can be done is to take just a technology viewpoint on solving a legacy issue. Um, you know, when you're starting to see um, organizations that are looking at managing cost over managing outcomes, um, or maybe even outsourcing um, core value streams to other people to solve for legacy issues, it can be quite problematic. Um, and what we kind of, one, one message I think we really want to get across here is when you're addressing legacy systems, you really want to take a holistic approach at this. And you want to look at what business outcomes you're actually driving towards um, before you necessarily start to look at the technology. Um, it can be, I think one of the things that we've seen um, is almost two extremes of tackling legacy. One of them being really an oversimplification. Uh, maybe if I reskin this and I address um, some user experience, we'll be okay. Um, not necessarily, because you may be able to reskin it and you may be able to address some user experience, but the underlying need or the way that that need is being served is not really being addressed. You haven't changed anything. You've just, you know, changed the facade. Um, or the other extreme being an overcomplication of um, of addressing legacy. And so sometimes what we've seen is, you know, maybe I need to do a complete overhaul, a complete rewrite in one go, and I'm going to try to rewrite an entire core system that might be over 30 years old. And that's an extremely risky strategy, uh, which inevitably ends in failure because you don't have enough support and funding to be able to continue such an initiative for so long. Um, so it, it's usually somewhere in between. It's never those two extremes. Uh, okay. Thanks, Amjad. Uh, on, the, on the point of, uh, that's technology, on the point of agility versus stable systems. Not sure what they mean by that. Perhaps water call. How does that play a role in this? Because the topic is rapid innovation. Yeah, I, I think that's a kind of a misconception, but I, I think it's worth addressing straight away, right? Uh, Stability 
is uh, is actually not adversely affected by a rate of change, provided that you adopt certain practices like uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, um, you know, some of these uh, practices around you know, SRE and DevOps. And there's a fantastic body of work um, about this by uh, Nicole Forsgren, uh, Jez Humble. Uh, they, there's a whole book, uh, Accelerate, and the State of DevOps Report that uh, takes a scientific approach to correlating practices to uh, outcomes. And one thing that it shows very, very clearly year over year, they've been doing this for a number of years now, is that actually um, if you're complete cowboy country with you know, nothing, no process at all, you know, gung-ho, everyone just you know, cowboy coding in production, okay, yeah, imposing some change management procedures and you know, putting some process in place uh, to encourage stability, probably a good thing. But you kind of hit a wall uh, if you have these strict change management processes where you can't actually climb past that. And actually top performers, uh, you know, people with the highest frequency of changes and lowest uh, change, change failure rate, uh, lowest mean time to remediation, uh, they actually make more frequent changes, but they do so in a safe and automated way. So agility and stability are not on opposite sides of some balance. Um, in fact, this in the right way. Wow, that's really interesting because sometimes agility is seen as breaking one thing in order to come up with something new. But you're saying that that doesn't have to be the case. It can coexist. Uh, well, I don't want people to think that um, bimodal IT is a good idea because it's not. Um, but yeah, I, I think just when it comes to systems, uh, mm -hmm. Agility is not counter to um, uh, stability. Great, thanks. So we seem to have covered quite a few things about change, about uh, readiness to adopt technology, um, about business conversations. So um, moving on to one question that's come in from Dan Toomey is, I think you can see it in the chat. So, uh, well, can you see it in the chat or I'll read it out? Maybe I'll read it out. You can see it. Uh, something about integration architecture playing a role in solving legacy system constraints. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, and this, this kind of goes off of what Amjad was saying earlier. Um, it's really important to, to take a conscious and uh, uh, conscientious approach to how you're going to tackle a legacy system. So, you know, the two extremes of oversimplifying uh, is being one side and overcomplicating being the other. I'm just going to architect a beautiful new system from scratch and, uh, you know, rebuild this whole thing that you know, might have evolved over 30 years, but I'm going to go to the whiteboard and draw some boxes. Uh, probably not. So taking a, a really deliberate and pragmatic approach to architecture of these systems is is quite important. And, and that starts with understanding the business constraints, doing things like event storming to map out the business processes that are captured in your current system. And then figuring out how you could carve off a, a piece of that, a portion of that independently that actually lines up with your business priorities. So a good example would be um, breaking down, I, I worked with a large financial services company in the US a few years ago to rewrite their card acquisition uh, mainframe system. This uh, credit card company that basically everything from you saying, hey, I'd love a credit card to them shipping it to you in the mail, including you know, checking counter uh, you know, money laundering lists and uh, fraud detection and approving your credit score, all that. We mapped out this whole system as it existed today using a process called event storming. And we mapped it out in a way that we showed the business critical paths. And we said, you know what? Based on your business priorities and based on this architecture that we see in front of us, fraud detection is a key area that we can quickly build a new version of this, experiment with some new technologies, new methods of fraud detection that will greatly move the needle in terms of business outcomes. And if you approve more applications that are not fraudulent, you make more money. Um, while 
incrementally modernizing the system. So Dan, to your point, tying that back, where does integration architecture play a role? Well, you really need to understand how, if you're going to carve an, a piece of your legacy system off, how is that going to integrate both at the data layer, uh, you know, at the user experience layer, how is it going to come together? So taking a very deliberate approach to that, a systematic approach to that is really key. Yeah, as opposed to, you know, I remember we worked with a with a client a couple of years back, David and I, and I remember they were actually taking a very different approach where they were looking at almost creating boilerplate code um, to be able to start thinking of microservices without actually having any idea of what the business need for that particular service may actually be. Um, and that's almost taking, uh, you know, sort of a very over architecting, over complicating approach without actually delivering the value. And I think one of the key things really here is, um, and we see this time and time again, if you're dealing with legacy, you really need to look at how can you break this up? It's a very risky initiative. How can you make a one massive risky initiative up into a series of smaller, less risky initiatives so that you can fight um, live to fight another day because we all know funding gets pulled. We all know that you know people lose interest. You need to be constantly delivering that value, and so taking a less, less risky approach and looking at smaller um, bets is 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 far more advantageous. Yeah, that might answer one of the questions: when to start? What's the sweet spot? Where to start as well? When and where to start? And it, it sounds like. You, you need to find those use cases. And you gave one example of the credit card fraud. Okay, looking at the time, you know, time goes really quick and we still have about five minutes. Um, so that uh, Dan was happy with that. Thank you, Dan, for the feedback. Um, uh, you know, there's a few technical questions that come in, talking about API mesh, talking about 5G. And uh, we hear your points on, on, on the business alignment and on the use case. Um, how would you say people need to weigh up this? Because there's IT investment, which is happening at the same time as business use case development. So what, what's been your experience at VMware? Maybe you have use cases or something like that to, to illustrate it around using API mesh, 5G, and other, other disruptive technologies. Yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe I'll, I'll address this more generally uh, because those technologies that serve very, very specific needs. So, um, Really, the way that we see it is uh, the best is when you have that business case, that business initiative, and you're aligning the IT uh, conversations with that. Because then you can prove out your IT infrastructure, the new products you're buying, the new platform you're building um, with a real use case. So, for example, you know, we hear everyone get really excited about containers and Kubernetes, and they're great technologies. They're great things. In fact, you know, VMware uh, has products based on Kubernetes and uh, you know, container orchestration, container management uh, as a key, key part of our portfolio of products. But um, if you just bought some fancy container orchestration system or you know, went all in on whatever it is, uh, whether it's GKE or Know, VMware is TKG, well, it's not going to do anything for you unless you actually can get valuable workloads leveraging this new technology and get teams enabled to use that technology. So the way to do that is really when you're looking at exploring a new technology, pressure testing it against your business problem that you're trying to solve. So if you're, you know, you're used to managing uh, VMs and you want to move more towards containers, Great, but don't just go spinning your uh, wheels playing with containers for six months. Uh, maybe do a quick POC, but uh, really look at for a specific business problem, how, how is that technology going to help me versus how is it going to distract me from my goals? Okay, food for thought there. And also another related question was, once you get something started, let's think positively about this, how do you keep stakeholders engaged? So I guess your, your response feeds into that. Solve the right problems, engage the people and the right technology, and that will 
be like a rolling ball. Has it been like that for you? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think there's a there's an added element to that as well, which is um, often, you know, legacy systems have legacy processes and legacy structures. Right? So you'll have specialists that work on certain areas of systems. And I think when you're addressing legacy, uh, a lot of the good stuff that David's talked about and a lot of the clients that we've actually helped address legacy, what we've done is also address their legacy process, their legacy structures. Um, and what you want to move towards, uh, and it's a good thing you mentioned that, Jonathan, earlier on, is autonomous teams. So the idea of cross-functional teams that are able to then start to deliver end-to-end -end value. Um, so as opposed to... Um, you know, the way that question was perhaps worded was keeping your stakeholders engaged. Maybe they need to be part of that process. And maybe you need to really rethink the way that you're delivering software. Um, and it's actually a more of a cross collaborative um, uh, sort of initiative and effort uh, as opposed to IT on the side and working in a sort of an agency model. You can really flip that on its head once you address some of that legacy. Yeah. Yeah, without using fancy terms like agile work streams and so forth. <laughs> yeah, or a squad, tribe, chapter, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no more. There's too much jargon. So thanks very much. I think we're coming up to the uh, the 30 minutes. All right? Did it feel like 30 minutes? So if there's any other questions, please put them in the chat, or perhaps there's a button you can press to, to speak to us. Not sure. Anyway, thanks so much. Uh, would there be anything else that we you feel urge, urgent to talk about from from this, from, from this topic's point of view? No, just uh, if if you're dealing with some legacy systems, you want some advice, you want a hand, feel free to reach out to Amjad and I and uh, link up with us. And what's the best way for people to reach you other than through the conference system here? Would you be um, would you be having a booth or would you be having a virtual booth or some other ways? How would you like to engage? Sure, Link, LinkedIn works good. If you're happy to find us on LinkedIn or um, you know uh, you know all through the conference system, yeah, we'd love to continue to have a chat. And I know that David mentioned around the whole event storming stuff and actually figuring out where to start. That's really important. So. Uh, yeah, we'd mm. love to continue the conversation. And yeah, so uh, if you want to hear a you know real world uh, example of this case study of this, the uh, talk that I'm giving with uh, Venki uh, later in the conference, um, talking about a return on investment with legacy system modernization uh, for a payments platform, would be a really good one to attend. Oh, thanks. That, that, that sounds really useful because there were questions on some case studies. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Amjad, David. Thanks to all the uh, participants and uh, have a great conference. Great. Thank you. See you, See you later. Bye-bye.